And I brought in two uh, top-notch experts, um, one whose uh, company, uh, Dan Miller, executive vice president of formerly known as Neighborhood America, but now known as Engage Networks. We're very early uh, before social media and kind of Web 2.0 was cool. Uh, they were doing uh, a lot of kind of problem solving uh, platform development for the public sector, everything from uh, the municipal to state all the way up to federal level. And he's gonna have some very interesting case studies and some things that he's done to, uh, to demonstrate to use what some of the power of open government and uh, social media tools can do from a governing perspective. And then secondly, um, I've uh, brought in a uh, freshman red eye from, uh, from Los Angeles and uh, uh, from Silicon Valley, uh, a gentleman I had a chance to meet when I was in uh, Palo Alto uh, earlier this year, um, who um, he, along with a merry band of other uh, technologists from Stanford University and others, have really created a grassroots kind of libertarian movement at exposing some of the budgetary and spending uh, corruption and lack of transparency in California. As you can imagine um, uh, what that challenge that is, and totally n not doing it with public blessing or political blessing, but just going out and being innovative and being entrepreneurial and being committed to, the, uh, to their fellow citizens of California. And uh, that's Joe Lons uh, Lonsdale. So let me uh, bring up um, Dan Miller, and he's got a short presentation, and then Joe's got some comments, and then we really want to open this up um, you know, open government should be an open conversation uh, from that standpoint. And, but we really just want to kind of give you an idea of what's possible and what we think how, you know, we literally talk about citizens being able to take their government back. But how do you do that back? How do you do that when you don't really have access to the data? How do you do that when you don't really have access to some of the same things that the very policy makers that you've elected have access to and are therefore trying to make decisions on your behalf of? So without further ado, Dan Miller. Thanks, Patrick, and um, thanks for everyone for attending. Um, you know, Patrick and I have talked over the last couple of weeks as I was preparing for uh, today's presentation and, and uh, panel discussion. And um, you know, one of the things that occurred to me as we, as as I think about our business and uh, and we've been at it now over 10 years, um, is that uh, many people think about open government as a, a kind of a an audit trail uh, type of situation. So kind of after the fact, let's be able to get into the data. Let's see where. Um, government spent their money where they spent their time and their effort. Um, and our approach is that uh, open government really starts at the beginning um, of the process. Uh, it, it starts by engaging with citizens in an open and transparent way and, uh, and creating collaboration uh, with multi-constituencies, um, uh, owners of the project, owners of lo either, you know, let's say a local municipality, and then uh, citizens who uh, some initiative or project may be affecting um, an agency that they serve, you know, that serves the, that uh, that that citizen group, and that's really been our approach. And, and so our company builds uh, using technology builds collaborative environments that enable this kind of engagement um, and collaboration and openness from the very beginning. So today, what I'm just going to do here, just a few minutes. Um, I'm going to uh, just show you a few case studies. Some go back a few years. Uh, some are very, very recent, uh, and we do business uh, and, and, and work with uh, agencies and, um, and groups at, uh, at federal, state, and local units of government level. So it's a very exciting uh, time as we move through it. So I'll just give you a few examples. Well, let me go back one. Sorry. Um, so this is kind of our, you know, I'll call it a social slant. Um, I don't want to confuse the social part of it with what we would all think about as social networking or you know, consumer or fun and games, uh, you know, uh, social networks like Facebook or Twitter and so on. Um, these are very focused, let's call them business uh, focused uh, and organized environments, collaborative environments. And they have some general themes. Um, our goals are to create environments that create uh, real time and measurable benefits um, by, again, creating transparency and open processes, processes that can be exposed to the citizens and also invite citizens to participate in the process. Um, these environments also enable much broader outreach and engagement with citizens. Uh, we look at the cost of transactions. The cost for all of you to be here today is fairly high. The cost for a citizen to participate in a town hall discussion is fairly high. And our approach and our, our strategy is to create <clears throat> collaborative environments using technology 
ultimately to lower the cost of those transactions and to enable the owners of a particular project to do a much broader outreach, um, also uh, equalizing the inputs. So if you think about uh, last summer as the healthcare debate was happening around the country and uh, the legislators in, uh, went back into their home states and, in their, and were holding town halls, you know, we saw it all over the news. It was a very heated discussion. Um, very adamant people were, uh, you know, in the audience. And very often in that kind of an environment, a very small f uh, number of people can really drive the agenda and really disrupt the, uh, the experience for the rest of the group. So by using technology, we can also equalize the, the opportunity, broaden and equalize the opportunity for input and also to gather that input in a very methodical and measured way, in a structured way, so that uh, the owners of the project uh, or the initiative can actually then run some analytics and run some reports um, to actually get to the real data points. So ultimately the goal is to, uh, again, create a, a much broader reach, improve citizen satisfaction with their government, and get citizens more involved in, in the process and to do that in an open and transparent way. So um, just a, a few uh, examples now, some case studies. This goes back a few years. We were just, I was just talking about healthcare debate. But a few years ago, we worked with uh, Health and Human Services, and we created, uh, we supported the Citizen Healthcare Working Group. Um, and that was to, uh, again, to do an outreach back in 2006 to get input into citizens about how the healthcare system could be evolved and improved. And uh, again, we used this kind of online participation um, that supplemented uh, and complemented uh, town hall uh, participation and ultimately drove the, the, you know, the cost of that participation down in a very measurable way. Um, we also were able to engage with a number of key stakeholder groups and constituencies uh, through that process. Um, another uh, project that we're very proud of is our work with the uh, National Park Service after 9-11. Um, we created a, uh, a, a website, really a design website, that uh, was a community that en enabled um, multiple constituencies, including the National Park Service, the airlines, uh, families of victims, and government officials to participate in the design of, of the memorial. Um, and uh, we hosted the site, we explained in that in environment, you know, what was the goal and the outcome that the, that the National Park Service was driving to, uh, and then we enabled the ingestion of various designs. And um, the project team who were uh, tasked with making the selections used uh, our administrative environment to um, analyze the, the inputs and the, the, uh, the entries into the, the uh, memorial design in a very secure way, collaborative environment to do that. We're very proud of that one. <clears throat> Is just a quick screenshot of, of the site. Whoop. Go back to that. Go. Okay. Um, so more recently, uh, we've been working. Uh, got the quick trigger. Um, we've been working more recently with the state of Michigan uh, over the last 12 months. I've, uh, I've actually spent, I live in Sarasota, Florida, but I've spent uh, almost every two weeks uh, over the last year up in the state of Michigan. And um, we've worked with a number of agencies in, in Michigan. Uh, if you don't know, Michigan also suffers from a huge uh, budget deficit and has probably the worst economy, state economy in the country right now. Um, and what they're trying to do is innovate um, by leveraging, and you'll see in a number of these environments, uh, innovate their economy to drive economic development within the state of Michigan by leveraging the um, really the energy and the passion and the innovation of the citizens within the state of Michigan. Uh, this particular example is um, in support of Michigan State University's extension school program, which touches uh, there's about 4,000 employees in that uh, in that school, and um, the the mission of that school is to do outreach. Uh, into local communities to, to drive curriculum into those communities. And as the economy evolves in Michigan, one of the challenges that that school has is to stay uh, relevant and to make sure that their curriculum uh, is relevant for today's you know, communities. And so uh, this environment was, was uh, made in order to uh, support uh, input from community and key stakeholders within those communities 
as to which way the curriculum should be driven um, uh, with regard to the, the Michigan State University Extension Program. So that's one. Uh, the next one is, um, um, the next one, <laughs> let me go back, hold on. Yeah. I'll say thank you right now. If you want. Let's see. Okay. Uh, okay. This one, this one, okay. This one is um, work that we've been doing with uh, the Michigan Department of Labor and Economic, uh, Labor, Energy, and Economic Growth. Um, and Michigan is trying to spin up, uh, we heard earlier about a healthcare economy here in, this, in the state of Georgia. Michigan is trying to spin up a energy economy. their are alternative energy, sustainable energy um, economy. And uh, this site is being promoted by and, and hosted by, um, by DLAG up there. Uh, with the goal of connecting uh, key stakeholders within the communities and counties and local townships within the state of Michigan um, to support uh, best practice, to create some best practices and uh, standards and also collaboration between different regions and different uh, townships within the state in order to, uh, to drive uh, innovation and econo economic development and industry clusters all around um, uh, new energy uh, related industries and and again um, it's uh, if we step back from it it is very much about open open and transparent and par transparent government um, because what they're trying to do is include citizens in that process from the very beginning and that's uh, again as I said earlier in, in, in my uh, in my presentation here that's the big shift is to do it at the very beginning of a project initiative so that the citizens have buy into the process Okay, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna, I'll yeah, actually right. pause right here because I'm not getting a lot of cooperation here. Um, so I'll, I'll pause here and maybe turn it over to, to Joe, Joe and, and then we can come back to questions later. Okay. Yeah? All right, cool. Thanks, Dan, that's yep. really cool stuff. Is this on? Yes. Thanks for inviting me, Patrick. Um, I realize it's a little bit ironic bringing in someone from California to talk about your uh, state government issues. It's kind of like having uh, Libya or Congo on the UN Human Rights Commission censoring the US here. Uh, California's been a bit of a punching bag today. But uh, so I mean, there are still actually a few iconoclasts amongst us out, out west, though. And uh, were you supplying against government waste in secret? It's really refreshing to be here among everyone. And everyone does seem to understand a lot of the key issues. Uh, one thing I take issue with a little bit, though, is that and everyone, everyone kind of gets that taxes are a problem. And, and this is like you go here and we talk about it and we talk about it again and again. And obviously, taxes should be lower. But uh, without lowering spending, lowering taxes is just deficit spending. It's, and so the real problem is how do we lower spending? And I, th I think spending is a much stronger issue to be talking about. And the reason that's interesting is, is because with modern technology, it's a lot easier to track what's going on with spending. It's a lot easier to show what's happening. And, and, and the, the truth is the government wastes lots and lots of money on stupid things. And, it's, and this is something that would, 20 years ago would have been really hard to show off. And now it's pretty trivial. Now, I, I, I obviously know California as a situation a little bit better because that's what we've been looking at. But in such, I mean, a few things there that are kind of ridiculous. There's, you know, there's 16 um, environmental organizations nationwide at the state level, and six of them are in California, and they're all competing against each other, spending billions and billions of dollars. Um, there's not only like competing air boards, environmental boards, but there's things like competing dental licensing boards or competing wage boards. It's just completely ridiculous. And, 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 and so, of course, California is more extreme than Georgia, but pretty much any government is going to have these kind of issues. And if you, I mean, so John, John Paul Getty, the famous businessman, said he'd walk into any business and cut the administrative cost by 20% right away. And it's just, that was just true of all businesses. And businesses are not nearly as inefficient as government is. So it's like, you always have administrative creep. You always have these problems. And the question is, how do we, how do we, base, how do we focus on this, expose it better, and fight that harder? Because we can fight for lower taxes all we want, but that's not actually the problem. The problem is, is exposing these things. And so I think what Dan's doing is really cool along these lines. Um, we, we've, we've been doing a, a bunch of different things in California for this. One, one thing is just putting a bunch of stuff up on the web about what does happen. So we created a giant map of all of California spending and exposed it. And some of this we were able to find and compile. Sometimes we had to call up departments to try to create that just transparency. So we would do things, I mean, there are, I guess there's 1,800 departments we documented. And a, a lot of them we'd call up and you'd get to the leaders. It'd take a while and they'd be nervous to talk to you. And you'd ask them things like, how many people work in your department? And they'd say, oh, well, that information doesn't exist. And, and, and it's like, 
Yes, and, and this, is, this is seriously the case, and, and it's because we're not doing things like trying to create transparency that we don't realize how egregious a lot of this is. The, another really important way of looking at it is that in the business world, you'll have these situations where all of a sudden, like, a new technology or a new uh, change in the economy comes along, and before there were 3,000 people doing a job, and now there's 10 people doing that job. This is, this is the business I started in, in 2004 called Palantir. It's a, it's a billion dollar software company because we figured out how to take a lot of things big companies were doing in IT and make it cost a few percent as much. And, 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 there's, and there's things like this that happen in business all the time and, and, and transform businesses. And meanwhile, governments, that'll happen and the department 10 years later will still have 10,000 people in it because no one comes along and says, this is absolutely ridiculous. We don't need everyone doing this. And so, so it's just, just, just in general, finding different ways of exposing that. We've, we've done a bunch of it with a, with a group of students at Stanford, CACS.org. I think it's just a really important conversation to have. And I think, especially coming from the right, I, we all know taxes are the problem, but if we did a better job showing off a lot of how ridiculous the spending is, I think that would actually be a lot stronger thing for, for us to do to actually make a difference. And all right, I'm gonna open it up for uh, Q&A here a little bit, but I'm also gonna ask some questions uh, myself. Um, can you talk a little bit uh, Joe, from your perspective, I mean, I think one of the things that uh, it's always hard for the average citizen to do is intuitively you know there's a lot of spending and things that probably don't make sense. Um, but using technology, and you mentioned the company that you founded in 2004, can you talk a little bit about how technology can make finding the waste easier and making it more visible for, for everyone to be outraged by? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, really, Information technology is only useful in the context of, a, of an insightful starting point and, and, and a model. And so there's a, there's a few different ways of doing this. One of the advantages we have looking at state spending is there's 50 other models to compare it against. So everything your state's doing, there's 49 other states that are doing something similar. And, and, and of course they have slightly different, I mean California is more expensive, so you have, maybe you have to adjust for the fact that it's more expensive to live there and things are going to be slightly more expensive. But when you find out that certain departments are costing 12 times as much even after you adjust for population, you know there's something really stupid going on. And this is how these things tend to work. I think all of us kind of assume that, oh, it's pretty rational. And I mean, people are up here, they're saying, it's just, we cut spending by 25% and it's so hard. And it's, and it's, it's absolutely ridiculous because you have these departments that are spending three or four times as much as they should relative to other states. And with technology, you can expose that and see that right away and say, listen, guys, we need to fix this. And, 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 it's, and it's actually really cool that people, I mean, we have an opportunity to do that in Georgia that we don't in California because the majority party in California doesn't really care about that kind of spending. I, it'd be really cool to see people out here actually taking these metrics and using comparisons. And, and it's, it's not hard to do. From the, uh, and, and Dan, from your experience in, uh, in the public sector uh, with these open government initiatives, I think some of the conversations I've had with legislators is, well, how do I manage a process where citizens are involved early? You know, because mm -hmm. sometimes politicians like to kind of try and think, kind of find the consensus, and then go out and sell it. How does it change the kind of legislative consensus building model when you have the process exposed so early for citizen participation? And that's, a, that's an ongoing challenge in any project uh, that, that you know, we've ever encountered. Um, and frankly, it's the bigger issue. It's the bigger challenge, which is how do you promote the fact that this agency, for example, is interested in exposing and being transparent and being open and wanting the engagement? So uh, what it comes down to is just like any brand has to create a communications and promotion and advertising and marketing plan. Um, citizens have to also have to, uh, within the environment, they also, citizens have to feel that um, they're giving value and getting value. They have to be incentivized to participate. And, um, and otherwise, you know, we're all busy and we won't participate. So as much as um, uh, the agency or the owner of the project may want to, that engagement to happen, in order to ensure it, the strategy uh, has to be in place well ahead of the technology, and that never changes. Yeah, but we've got yeah, questions here. all over, actually, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, more to your discussion about uh, collabor what you were talking about. What are the um, stages of development of, of a good collaboration environment, and what are the early and late payoffs? Yeah. And, ha and how do you sell all of that? Yeah, it's, well, so that's about a six-month, you know, answer to your question. It's a great question, so thanks. But um, it's, a, it's a big, the, the answer is fairly complicated. Um, where we try to start is 
what are the goals for, the, for that environment? What are the key outcomes that, that, because the agency is taking a risk by being transparent and being engaging and open up front. Um, you know, in, in, in ret, you know, kind of converse to the, the situation that you've been describing, which I think is, you know, t incredible what you're doing. You know, if an, if an agency owner or an executive decides that, you know, we're going to kind of change, flip the model here and actually do this, it's a little scary. So what we try to do is get them to focus on some really key outcomes. And it's kind of like, where can you get the biggest bang for the buck? Um, what, are the, what's the, what are the low hanging fruit uh, opportunities to show success? Um, and focus on those things as a first step. Um, then we want to understand who's the audience. You know, are, is, it, is it key stakeholders within a region, as an example? Are they economic development executives? Are they elected officials? Is it key business owners? Or is it citizens you know, in general? Um, and then de depending on who those, that key audience is, you've got to then develop a strategy, a communication strategy, to, as I said, reach them promote to them, create value for them, um, and incentivize them to participate. And that's just a strategic process. Um, the, the kind of the, the agency, where, where you'll get the, the real traction is where agencies already have existing networks, where they're already doing things to engage with groups, and what we're doing is, again, using technology just to make that much more efficient and broader based and lower cost. That's the way to think about it. Well, I mean, if you build the technology, if you just roll the technology and you don't think about that other stuff, then it, it'll fail because there's no one that, you know, no one's going to come. So, yeah, it's more important than the technology is what I would say. Dan, why don't you share, because I know you've done a lot of work uh, with Department of Transportation across the country where there's a, typically a large public <clears throat> notice kind of... Can we, uh, thing around yeah, I'm, I'm going to actually give you two, two just very quick uh, examples. We work with maybe 30, 30, 35 states, and we've got a long history in these kind of Department of Transportation initiatives. And generally, you know, these would be like a highway project or some kind of, you know, uh, area environmental improvement project. Um, and so the typical scenario would be that uh, they would, we, through using uh, our platform, they would spin up kind of a, a, a website that would support informationally, you would think about you know, what's going on in the project and how it may affect you and your, your life, your commute, whatever that might be. And then that site gets promoted, and say you're talking to the general audience of, of citizens, um, and then through that site, uh, we're in essence asking for them to give their opinion or to, you know, to go through a process of interaction um, and that's, that's a very simple approach that, that can, you know, be done very efficiently. And then those sites are then promoted in the town hall discussions as a way to broaden it. It's promoted in the press. It's promoted through, you know, their, their normal outreach methodologies. Um, and that, that seems to work really well. Um, as an, another example, just the other end of the spectrum, we're, with Michigan right now, we're working with the Office of Management and Budget. And one of the things they're thinking about is... Um, kind of flipping the model, I mentioned this earlier, the, kind of flipping the RFP model around for engaging with over 50,000 state of Michigan vendors and, um, and flipping the model so that instead of replying to an RFP that an agency develops or pays a consultant to develop um, and where when they deploy it and when they ingest responses to the RFPs and make an award, they very often have a kind of a firestorm of the vendors, you know, pointing fingers and, and worrying about, you know, there was some backdoor deal or it was wired for one company versus another. The model we're playing around with up there is uh, flipping around. Instead of bidding an RFP, we're going to create a collaborative environment where they'll be able to bid the problem. So the agency will actually, within this collaborative environment, will detail what problem or challenge they're facing and then open it up for participating vendors to ideate around the solution for the problem. And that'll all happen prior to the RFPs. Not to say they won't have an RFP process, but by, by then uh, ingesting those ideation, those ideas, uh, they'll now, the state will then have an archive of the process at which they'll be able to use to their benefit, you know, to, to kind of defend, you know, as a, almost as in a defensive position, but could also allow vendors to, uh, to innovate off of each other. So I don't want to take, that's a neat idea though. Good afternoon. Uh, John Futchko I'm with the uh, CPLI class, and I had two questions, probably directed mainly towards Joe, but Dan, you might be able to sure. give us some insight, too. Uh, the first one is just whether you're familiar with the OpenGeorgia.gov website, which is Georgia State's government's 
effort sure. at that and kind of if you had any feedback on that. The, uh, the second one was what role do you see external and internal auditors in government playing as part of this kind of this process that, uh, that you have underway? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm a little bit familiar with what, with what, what you guys have done there. I, I checked it out, and I think, I think stuff like that is, is awesome. We need to tie it to, so people actually have incentives along those lines of, of responding to what's happening. I, I, think, I think external auditors are really important. What, what, t what tends to happen when you bring in, bring in the public is very important. We need to do this more, but what tends to happen is the guys on the inside, they are marketing and they are creating their brand, and they are fooling the public. So, so you'll take the park service in California, for instance, which has thousands of people it's sitting at desks, getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And what happens is you cut their budget, and they have this giant administration up here, and they have the guys actually doing the stuff at parks that people care about, and they'll, and they'll cut the budget, and you, they'll start cutting their employees at the parks themselves, and people go to the parks, and there's problems. And, and, and so everyone's like, oh, we can't cut that budget. We need to give them more money. But actually, you could have cut like 2,000 of these administrators sitting up top, which tends to be the case with almost every layer of government. And so it's, it's really... You have, to, you have to be careful when you're doing the odd, to be honest, and, and, and when you're doing the outreach, to be honest about what you're actually spending money on and where the waste really is. And it's, it's, sometimes this stuff gets to be a little complicated. I have, actually, I have a follow-up question for you. Just, I'm curious, um, in, the, in the initiatives in California, because I'm not familiar with your initiative, um, where does your voice go? Like, you've, you've obviously, you know, the research is there, you've exposed it. Yep. Now what? What's happening? Yeah, no, this is, it's, 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 a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a relatively new effort. It's more of a student, student movement, and mm -hmm. we, have, we, have, we have, you know, a couple, a couple hundred more students joining up and, and making some noise online about it. But uh, in California, there's not really too many places for it to go. We're, we're, our our, our longer-term view is that if we can make people more aware of how inefficient and broken government is, we can start to chip away at the dominant political ideology in our, in our area. Got but it, but we, we, we feel like somewhere in, like in Georgia, there might be more people who could be appreciate these sorts of efforts. Got it. Um, my, my quick response, I went to the site, you know, Patrick and I talked, and I, I went to the site and looked through it, and there's a lot, a little, a lot of data there, just a lot of data. And what I found was, as a citizen, I'm not, you know, how do I ingest that data? How do I make sense of it? Um, and I, so I think that, you know, one thing the state of Georgia could do is to look at somehow, you know, some kind of analytics environment that would actually, you know, give you some kind of dashboard, you know, kind of easy to read, you know, take that raw data and turn it into something that we, that me that I could actually understand because I went through a number of the reports, you know, it, it's, it's really tough to get little, through. Yeah, too yeah, the, yeah. The, and, and, and the key thing is finding the egregious examples and getting the people to be aware of them and promoting those and saying, listen, this is how broken government is. Here's an example of what's there and we're going to fix this. And, 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 and it's, you, the more you make people aware that it's their job and they should get together and they should fix these things, the more it's going to happen. Right? The attitude needs to be, how can we shrink it? And, and it is ridiculous because because that is a situation, and most people aren't aware of that. Okay. Hi there. My name is Molly Dye, and I'm with the Conservative Policy Leadership Institute. This is to either one of you. This may be a ridiculous question, but if an agency within the state of Georgia purchased your service or your software or your product. Can you throw out an estimate of what this might cost? Not, I mean, not, not really without understanding what the project would be. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I'm actually not selling anything. It's just yeah, a student I, movement I helped start. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is Loretta Lapore, and I'm with the CPLI class. I was wondering how the agencies are funding the projects in Michigan. You mentioned that they are state and local collaboratives. So is this the funding coming strictly through the state or are local entities participating in that cost? And additionally, if the state agencies are the ones funding the project, how are they selling that idea into the public sector where they're competing with other priorities, such as healthcare, education, et cetera? Yeah, it's actually, um it's a, it's a very good question, and the way it's been positioned uh, and funded in Michigan uh, is, is actually through budget cuts, uh, these kinds of environments enable uh, to the state agencies to do more with less. That's the ultimate goal. Um, so they're actually funding it with, with resources that, uh, that you know, they're cutting back on. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense as I, the way I'm positioned, I'm listening to myself say it. Um, what I mean is that they have available dollars uh, to, um, to spend on systems that provide efficiencies over and above the 
personnel resources or in, in lieu of personnel resources or where they've cut back on personnel, they're actually spending money on technologies that are, are scalable and broad, can be broad, broadly uh, 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 focused and reusable. And that's, so they're coming from agency operating, at the end of the day, they're coming from agency operating budgets. Now, in some cases, like with uh, the Department of Labor and Economic, uh, Energy and Economic Growth, there is some level of federal funding into that agency as well. I think Michigan actually receives more federal dollars, uh, and again, I don't know exactly what areas, but than, than any other state today. Um, so some of those funds are uh, f related to creating energy economies, new, new industry clusters. And, and so some of the funds for that particular project uh, are coming from there. One of the things I wanted to ask you both about, particularly because Joe's movement is kind of a, a, a grassroots movement being led by students and people, um, is this whole idea of crowdsourcing from an idea generation. I know David Cameron and uh, the government and conservative government in England, one of the things they did early is I think they were trying to build consensus around uh, cutting the budget was they had set up a platform for employees actually to make suggestions and then measure, and then they later open that up to the public. Can you tell me a little bit about crowdsourcing, you know, getting ideas from citizens? How do you manage that process? How do you then take that process and get it in a meaningful way to where a legislator or a policymaker can kind of take all that participation and all that energy and then actually do something with it? Uh, sure. So, I mean, this is something that we often use in Silicon Valley at our companies there, both for our employees and for people we interact with, obviously, is basically either getting anonymous feedback or, or finding ways of just seeing in general what everyone, what everyone thinks. And I, I mean, bas basically, I mean, ba basically, it's not something the government does very much at all right now, which is why I think what Dan is doing is, is, is very cool. I, I, think, I, think that the, I, I think that the obvious places you should use it are probably within state government, first of all. Like if, I mean, if I, was, if I was in charge, I'd basically make it so that you got rewarded for being able to find ways to save money inside the government and that you had a system where everyone was encouraged to call out any kind of waste or any that they could trim within their agency. I think that system would be really cheap to build and, you, and, you'd, and you'd see a ton of places where you'd be able to cut back right away. So I think, I think that'd be great and I'd love to hear, hear Dan's thoughts. Sure, I, I, you know, a little bit of a different you know, slant on it. Um, you kind of have to be a little bit careful about what you wish for. Um, and so it goes back to the, the strategy because crowdsourcing environments create a very different behavioral, there's a behavioral science and they create a different behavioral environment than other types of collaborative environments. And so what crowdsourcing is really the goal of that, that kind of environment uh, when it's done right is to actually kind of find the long tail idea. You know, so this is this concept of not top down ideas but bottom up ideas. And what it, what it enables because it's it, it, it is uh, harnessing the assets and the, the insights of a large group of people. It enables those needle in the haystack, very innovative ideas to find their way, you know, to find a voice, to find their way to the top um, because they, are, they find acknowledgement through a large base of people. And that's really the key to it. So um, you have to be very careful about the, the questions you ask and the, or the issues you're trying to solve in those environments um, because they can get pretty dicey. Um, it does also, those environments also tend, if done well, create a little bit of a social competitiveness. Um, and uh, what happens is those ideas, uh, uh, I, the idea makers or the innovator makers, innovation makers, uh, get kind of jazzed that their idea is gaining traction. And so one of the things that has to be careful is that how, you know, how are they promoting themselves? And is it an artificial, idea, you know, great idea? Or is it really, uh, you know, an organic idea that does bubble to the top? And um, because uh, in most of these cases, uh, the, the uh, creator of the idea or the answer, the best answer, let's say, also gains visibility within these environments. So there's, there's a little bit of social science to it and to get it right. Any other questions? I just found a new name for the Tea Party, crowdsourcing. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Margaret Williamson and I am a founder of one of the Tea Parties in North Georgia. And um, thank you for what you're doing, Joe. We could use you in Georgia. Um, we, our mantra 
other than lower taxes and less government, is to be informed and be involved. And it is very difficult to be informed to find out what's going on. Usually it's after the fact. And now, I think, in um, following this previous election, is that what we plan to do is um, get together by states, southeastern division, and we'll be having something coming up. But we want to be more proactive and put together what we think the legislation should be, rather than waiting for the legislators to enact things, and then we come in and say, yeah, you're an A. Um, what would you advise us in that sense? How would you advise us? I, I would talk to your elected officials. Uh, in, our, in our case, in Michigan, it took us almost three years to influence the government up there to actually embrace this kind of approach. Um, and so we're, you know, today as a, as a private company, you know, we're, we're reaping, you know, the rewards of that. But um, the, 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 the elected officials, the agency directors, you know, they have to champion the idea. Um, they have to actually, I remember, I live in Sarasota, Florida, and a, a buddy of mine is now the, the retired, but he was the CIO of the county, and I talked to him about five years ago, and I was saying to him, you know, collaboration, open environments, he goes, why do we want to hear from citizens? That was the response, and you know, I, I laughed a little bit with him, but, I, but he was serious, and the, the, this is the point, is that I think, you know, the way it's been is what's up for change right now, right? It, it, but the way it's been is that government officials generally don't want to necessarily engage in the process with citizens and or with key stakeholders uh, holders during, you know, during the process. And that's what has to change. That's a challenge. Yeah, so the, the, the approach we're taking, a, again, is to, to map out the different departments that we're skeptical of, and in our case, mapping out all of them, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, compare, and, and, then finding, and then finding direct comparisons to other states and other things where you can clearly demonstrate that something's being done inefficiently. Because once, once you have a comparison, this is costing twice as much, and, you, and you've looked at it, and you kind of understand why, and then you see like there's, there's waste there. I think that's a really positive thing to attack. Um, where, where I come from, almost all the legislatures are bought off by the unions, and so I haven't had the, the pleasure of being able to work with people who actually might care about fixing this, this kind of problem, but that's, that's how I'd start. And uh, the, the name of his site, again, it's, a, it's Californians for Common Sense. It's CACS.org. Uh, very innovative, again, being sponsored by some of the brightest and the best uh, young folks from, from uh, Stanford University. So. Um, any other questions? Uh, any other thoughts here before we, we close it out? Well, thank you uh, for those of you who stayed uh, all the way through. Like I said, I know we we're competing with the uh, Auburn, Georgia contest here, and the legislators, <laughs> especially, I appreciate who've stayed and, and uh, participated.